He's been called the Oracle of Omaha, the Sage of Nebraska. And from a young age, he knew he would be rich. I could figure out when I was 10, if I had a fairly long life, I was going to end up with a lot of money. He was right. 70 years later, he was the richest man in the world, a tycoon with a rock star aura. I've never known anyone as focused as he is. It's amazing. He wants to be the best he can be at what he's doing. And what he's doing happens to make a lot of money. Warren's very young and energetic. Warren is super interested in the latest things going on. And there's so much that you just absorb from Warren's approach to things. But among all those winning bets, there have also been dramatic brushes with financial disaster. Both the company and I personally promised Treasury that we would uh, aggressively help them in finding out anything we've done wrong in the past and to make very sure that it doesn't happen in the future. And I was scared. I was scared stiff. There were a lot of people that wanted us to go out of business over that weekend, and I didn't know what was going to happen. And behind his folksy demeanor, there's one of America's shrewdest and toughest businessmen. You don't make $40 billion by being Mr. Rogers or by being one of the Muppets. Warren takes no prisoners when it comes to a negotiation. He uses every bit of leverage that he can. This is going to be one of those days that lingers in the mind. The way the Dow was down two or three hundred. Nobody knows what in these bundles. A category five test of our financial plan. It was a terrifying moment in U.S. financial history. In 2008, some of Wall Street's biggest banks and investment firms were about to fail, threatening to take much of the world's economy down with them. Inside the citadels of money and power, desperate calls for help went out to the same person, as dramatized in this HBO TV movie. We're thinking of reaching out to Warren Buffett. Great. You and Buffett go back, right? Do me a favor and call him. Tell him we're even this rock solid. During the days that the financial crisis was unfolding, he was viewed as the go-to person. If you're in trouble, Warren Buffett can save you. For most of his life, Buffett avoided the Wall Street ways of risky speculation. In fact, he stayed far away from Wall Street itself. Warren really is a product of Omaha especially in the era that he grew up there, the virtues of modesty, thrift, plain spokenness, and Warren really exemplifies those. Warren Buffett still lives and works just a short distance from where he was born in 1930. And it was here in Omaha that he began his obsession with all things financial. It hit me right away. It was like kids that like to play the piano early or something of the sort. I always like numbers. I, I knew I was going to be interested in stocks the rest of my life, but probably at the time I was, um, you know, eight or nine. I used to keep charts on all kinds of stocks when I was uh, that age. My aunt gave me a, a world almanac, so I'm, I memorized the population of all uh, uh, cities of any real size. But I, I just like numbers. It, it, was, it was not limited to, to business numbers at all. Buffett also had the uncanny ability to remember all those numbers and how they fit into the big picture, a skill that would be the bedrock of his later success. Former Wall Street analyst Alice Schroeder is the author of The Snowball, Buffett's authorized life story. Warren grew up in the Great Depression. The family did not have money at all because his father had lost his job as a stockbroker. And so around the dinner table, money was what they talked about. But Buffett wanted to do more than talk. My grandfather had a grocery store, and I used to buy Coca-Cola from him in six packs for a quarter and sell them for a nickel each. I sold the Saturday Evening Post door to door. I sold Ladies Home Journal. I had all kinds of little ventures. Not all, not all hugely successful, I might add. I liked doing business early on. Journalist Roger Lowenstein wrote an early biography of Warren Buffett. Then he gets into more exotic things. He collects golf balls. He gets other kids in the block to do that with him. They, they collect golf balls and resell them. He's picking up stubs at the racetrack when he's 10, 11, 12, because some of them haven't been used yet. He grows up knowing he wants to make money. You know, investing in business comes later, but it's in him. Buffett made enough from these ventures to do what, until then, he had only dreamed of doing, playing the stock market. First stock I bought was Sydney Service Preferred. 
was a stock that had passed the dividend for how many years, 20 years or something like that. And so it had large accumulated dividends and it was selling at 38 and a quarter and I bought three shares. I went all in, that was, all the, that was my entire net worth. <laughs> at the same time, Buffett's stockbroker father, Howard Buffett, had won a seat in Congress as a conservative Republican. And in 1943, he took the family to Washington. It was a chance for Warren to start a new business, delivering papers for the Washington Post. Well, I started with a couple of routes because I was good about delivering papers on time. So then they gave me these absolutely prime routes. Got up to where I was making probably $150 a month or something, which was a lot of money. In that. And I was making it all before I went to school in the morning, in the morning so it was good. Savings from those paper routes became the seed money for his later empire. I'd made $9,800, and I made most of that delivering papers. I delivered about 500,000 papers, and I made about a penny a piece. So I made about $5,000 for the delivery of papers. After high school, he was ready to go full-time as a businessman and investor, but his father convinced the 16-year-old Buffett to go to college first. At the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, he roomed with fellow Nebraskan Charles Peterson. He was very immature. He wore tennis shoes, or if he wore shoes other than that, he had a hard time having them both be the same color. He may have a black and a brown shoe on and never know the difference. Hair messed up. But Buffett was way ahead when it came to academics. Uh, every day after class, I'd spend so many hours studying. Warren, on the contrary, uh, picked up the, the books that were applicable to him and uh, sat there and flipped through them page by page. Uh, and he might be through two or three courses in a, in a couple weeks. He had a photographic uh, uh, mind. Uh, I did not. And Buffett had a unique way of spending all those hours he did not have to study. At that time, he was crazy about Al Jolson. Mammy. And he'd play those records, Mammy, Mammy, how I love you, Mammy, and mimic an, an hour after hour. And uh, what other songs, you know, at that time, was ready to go crazy. And when he wasn't singing, Buffett was getting his first taste of political activism. I was president of the Young Republicans Club at the University of Pennsylvania, and, and uh, I even ran for delegate to the National Convention one time as a Republican. After breezing through college, Buffett went to interview for Harvard Business School. I was 19 at the time, and the fellow spent about 10 minutes with me, and he said, you better, he said, you better come back again later. It was very clear I'd won the interview. <laughs> After being rejected by Harvard, Buffett set his sights on Columbia's business school, where Wall Street maverick Benjamin Graham was a professor. Graham's investment philosophy was simple, but it defied conventional Wall Street wisdom. Many people take their cues as to what to do from what the market itself is doing, but Graham would, would tell you that the market is, is there to serve you, not to inform you. And basically he was saying the market will be wrong. Now, that flies in the face of what a lot of other people think. But Graham would say that sometimes the market is very, very wrong. And if you look at the prices of stocks as buying pieces of businesses, you will be able to recognize when the market is very wrong. Graham's way was to find undervalued stocks that were off the radar. And Buffett became his most devoted disciple. He taught us to find a dollar bill that was going to be, you could buy for 50 cents, but the dollar bill wouldn't necessarily increase in value very fast. And I analogize that to essentially walking down the street looking for cigar, cigar butts with one puff left in them. And they weren't very attractive, and, and there was maybe only one puff in them, but they didn't cost anything. Armed with the Graham philosophy, Buffett headed back to Omaha to start his own business. He said, I'm going to form a partnership. And he said, would you want in? I said, sure, I do. There was only uh, seven or eight people in that original partnership. Convincing people beyond the first seven investors got rockier. My sales pitch wasn't very effective. I was, I was 20 years old. Uh, I looked like I was about 16, and I probably behaved like I was about 12. So I would go around and call on people. They were always nice to me. But I would see a Mr. Smith, and, and uh, I would go through all of these facts and figures about why you should buy some stock. And when I got all through in my head I would count to three, I would go one, two, three, and then 
Mr. Smith would say, what does your dad think? And I would always want to hit him. But <laughs> it was frustrating. Buffett knew that he had to be a better salesman. So he turned to popular self-help guru, Dale Carnegie. Well, I, I, I had to be able to communicate with people better. And, and I mean, in groups particularly. I just knew that I, I couldn't go through life terrified of public speaking, and I'd, I'd heard about the Dale Carnegie course. And he applied those lessons when he began dating hometown girl Susan Thompson. I mean, I proposed to my wife during, during the Dale Carnegie course. So, I mean, I got my money's worth right, right off, right, right during the course. I had the intellect to succeed, but I did, I, I did not have the persona. I was not put together as a person un, until I met her. Buffett was finally ready to put his career in gear. He was picking stocks that others were ignoring, and his stocks kept going up. Little by little, word spread around Omaha that the kid knew what he was doing. He's devouring every annual report, and they stay devoured. He remembers them, and he, you know, he, he's got these balance sheets in his mind so that if a stock gets cheap, you know, three years later, he remembers what the fundamentals of the company are. This is a buy now. In the first five years that Buffett was in business, the Dow rose by 74%, while Buffett's investments had gone up 250%. In 1961, at the age of 30, he reached millionaire status. Friends like Stan Lipsy saw that he was still operating as a one-man band. His study was right off the bedroom in their house. He wasn't even in an office building at that point. And they had three kids. And people joke about Warren not knowing his kids, and that's, of course, a great exaggeration. But the fact of the matter, Susie stabilized the family so that Warren could do the studying that he needed. His wealth was growing rapidly, but you couldn't tell that from the way the family lived. Their home, which Buffett still lives in, was bought over 50 years ago for $32,000. His children all went to public schools. Susie Buffett is the eldest of three Buffett children. We grew up in a way that uh, I think is probably different than most kids if you've got a dad who has what my dad has. I mean, we didn't get cars when we turned 16. We didn't, we didn't live any differently, really, than most of the other kids we knew. The biggest change in the Buffett household was that Warren was moving away from the staunch republicanism of his father. Civil rights had the biggest effect on changing my, my views on politics. Neither party necessarily covered themselves with glory on it, but it was clear to me that a basic change, a really basic change in civil rights was called for, and the Democrats seemed to be much more attuned to that than the Republicans. And Buffett was about to make an even bigger change in his professional life. In his 30s, Buffett wanted more than just being a stock picker. He wanted to find companies that he could buy a controlling interest in. And he found one a hundred miles away in Beatrice, Nebraska. Themster Mill was a, a company that was really not doing very well. It was in the windmill business. Of windmills now have come back, but it was not a good business to be in 50 years ago. But the stock was selling very cheap, so I started, I started buying stock in that. It was a business that had built up a lot of inventory that it didn't need, and it had a labor force that was too big. So it was a company that just needed to be downsized. And of course, the town that it was in was very small, and it was the main employer. A hundred people lost their jobs, and Buffett took the heat. What it taught Warren Buffett was that he did not want to get involved anymore in businesses that had labor problems, where he would have to fire people, where he would have to get involved personally in the management. He wanted somebody else to do that. It became another guiding principle of Buffett's evolving master plan. Buy businesses whose management you trust enough to leave in place. Buffett's next big investment also looked like a potential failure. It was a textile mill called Berkshire Hathaway, whose stock was selling for $7.50 a share. We bought a textile company that was destined eventually to go out of business, just like every other New England textile uh, company did. It was a mistake. Glenn Tung is a managing partner for T2 Partners. Berkshire Hathaway was not a good business. They didn't have a competitive advantage that allowed them to earn a sufficient return on the capital invested in the business. So while they were profitable to some extent, that profitability was inexorably being squeezed. When the cash was extracted out of Berkshire Hathaway, it was reinvested first 
major reinvestment that was enormously profitable was the insurance business, and that drove everything that Berkshire Hathaway did from then on. Andrew Fry is a reporter for Bloomberg News. So he moved the company basically from textiles to insurance, and part of the reason was because the industry itself generated profits, but also because through the premiums that they gathered up from their policyholders, Buffett was able to take that and make his stock investments. It's called the float. Money comes in interest-free from insurance premiums, which then gets invested in other businesses. And while the textile mill eventually died, he kept the name Berkshire Hathaway, which would live on as the name of his soon-to-be multi-billion dollar company. Well, rather than try and rename it every few years based on what I've just bought, uh, why not just stick with the original? People, uh, people know what Berkshire Hathaway is about. It says so much about him, about Buffett, that he sticks with Berkshire Hathaway. Anyone else, they would have gone to, you know, BH Diversified Resources. Uh, he likes it. He likes the history of the company. He's not a changeling. Buffett was now on a roll, buying bargains like C's Candies and Blue Chip Stamps, a popular shopper's loyalty program of that era. Like the insurance business, it delivered interest-free cash that could be used for future investments. I think I have just enough books. That's quite a business. And he'd found a professional partner who was as market savvy as he was, Charlie Munger, who was working as a lawyer when the two first met. Well, Charlie Munger actually grew up a half a block from where I live. He worked at my grandfather's grocery store, as did I, but he was six years older and I never knew him at all in Omaha. And then through a mutual friend, uh, we got introduced. In about 10 minutes, I knew that <laughs> this guy and I were going to do a lot of things together over the years. When I met Warren, he immediately started telling me how much better his way of making a living was than mine and that I was too smart to stay in such a silly business as law practice when I could go into his business of running an investment partnership. And it took me about two or three years to, to uh, realize he was right. In the late 1960s, Wall Street was in the midst of an unprecedented boom. Stock prices were soaring as everyone rushed into the stock market. But for Buffett, it was time to get out. I was running a little, little over $100 million and had a lot of happy partners. And I wrote them a letter and I said, you know, I don't know how to play in this game anymore. The valuations have gotten uh, to where I can't find things. I terminated my partnership in 1969. It seems counterintuitive, but Warren has always quoted Gus Levy, who said, be greedy when others are fearful, be fearful when others are greedy. And Warren knew that the party would come to an end and at some point the bubble would burst. Buffett was 40 years old and was worth more than $25 million. But without the partnerships to oversee, he started getting restless and in 1973 made a fateful decision to buy into a California bank called Wesco. The problem was, Wesco was in the middle of a merger deal with another company. And the next thing you know, the company that was going to buy Wesco complained to the Securities and Exchange Commission that Warren was trying to bust up their merger, which would have been illegal. And so an investigation launched. The SEC went through every nook and cranny of Buffett's businesses and what they saw alarmed them. Buffett and Munger's investments were a complex spider web of ownerships and cross ownerships. We had drifted in since we had several companies, so the whole thing looked like so much spaghetti that it had been done for some evil master purpose. We didn't feel we'd done anything improper, but there were a lot of rules and, and, and the, the question was whether uh, we'd violated any of them. Stanley Sporkin was director of enforcement at the SEC. Anytime you find that things are so wired that they take a long time to be able to understand them, that types of activity like that uh, raises a suspicion that maybe somebody is doing that to get away with something. What also raised investigators' suspicions was that Munger and Buffett were offering Wesco shareholders a higher price for their stock than they could get on the open market. So we just kept buying until our allotment ran out at two or three points higher than we had to. Well, that was a very eccentric thing to do, but we thought it was the right way to behave, and the SEC went berserk. You can't manipulate a stock. 
In other words, you can't take actions for the sole purpose of causing that stock price to increase. And if you do, it violates the law. The accusations stung. The Westco investigation was really the first time that anyone had ever challenged Warren Buffett's reputation. And he responded to it almost as though a rattlesnake were about to bite him because it really threatened his career. Trying to head off disaster, Buffett's lawyer made an unorthodox appeal to Stanley Sporkin. And saying, look, uh, Stan, even though uh, this doesn't look good from your standpoint, I want you to take into account the character of the individual. In my view, meaning Rickershauser's view, he probably is going to be the number one person in the financial services industry of all time. The appeal worked. Buffett's company, Blue Chip Stamps, was fined just over $100,000, but no charges were filed against Buffett. So he became even stricter, even more proper in his behavior and in worrying about his reputation. In 1973, Berkshire Hathaway stock price hit a new high of $93. Its profits driven mostly by their insurance businesses. Buffett also owned stakes in banks, clothing makers, and candy factories. But there was one business he was passionate about owning. I love newspapers. I mean, I started reading newspapers. You know, my dad would bring them home one day. I don't know whether it was six or seven or eight. And it was the first thing I'd grab. You know, my sisters would grab them, too. We all liked to read his first newspaper purchase was an Omaha weekly called The Sun. The Sun was a very small business. I mean, it had never made any money at all. Stan Lipsy was the publisher of Sun Newspapers. We were a weekly publishing against the daily, so we had to uh, initiate stories, hopefully investigative pieces, and we'd sit there and brainstorm what we could do. At one meeting, Buffett suggested doing a story about Boys Town a legendary home for orphan boys located just outside Omaha and made famous by the 1938 movie with Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney. 4,000 boys have passed through this city of little men. It was sort of common knowledge around Omaha that the money was pouring in there and the number of boys had gone down. They'd, they'd had a thousand boys at the peak and now I knew the population had gone down so I, I, I thought there was a story there. Buffett knew that charities like Boys Town had to disclose their net worth in a federal form called a 990. So Warren said to us, go to Washington and get the Boys Town's 990 and you'll have a lot more information. And that was about the most important piece of information we could lay our hands on. That led to the headline, which was 700 boys with $209 million. And the kicker, the overline was, Boys Town, America's richest city. The story won a Pulitzer Prize in 1973, a rare honor for a local weekly newspaper. There was a phone call from Stan Lipsy, and he said, we want the Pulitzer on this. It was a big day. Buffett now had a taste of the big leagues, and he wanted more. He set his sights high on the influential Washington Post. They had a virtual monopoly. There was one competitor that was going to go out of business soon in Washington, D.C. It's a town hooked on news, so uh, what more could you ask for? And in addition to that, it was the paper that he had an association with as a, as a teenager carrying it, delivering the paper. At first, Buffett wasn't sure how much he wanted to invest. Then, the Washington Post broke the Watergate story, and President Nixon inadvertently made his decision easier. 1973, the stock had gone down a lot, partly in response to the fact that, that the Nixon administration had sort of declared war on the Washington Post. The stock fell from, eventually fell, I think, from 38 to like 15 or so, and we bought a lot of stock in a very short period of time. I mean, people were barreling out of the stock, big institutional investors. And the interesting thing is, is when we were buying that stock at $20 a share, if you'd asked the people who were selling it to us how much the company was actually worth the businesses, they would have said $100 a share. But they sold it anyway. I salute uh, the Nixon administration for, <laughs> for stirring up the dust at that time. Buffett's rule had always been to keep his distance from his company's managers and executives. But that was not the case at the Washington Post. 
where publisher Catherine Graham became his social partner and confidant. What Catherine Graham offers to Warren Buffett is a seat at the larger table. Suddenly, uh, you know, he's at dinners with Henry Kissinger, and suddenly he's not just an investor from Omaha, you know, he's a part of the scene in, in, in Washington. He's meeting Ben Bradley, uh, the President of the United States. This was not his world, and Catherine Graham was really his entree into that world. She was in a business that fascinated me. So she would invite me to these various Washington parties, which were, were interesting. I, I mean, I, I saw parts of the world that I wouldn't have seen otherwise uh, if, if, if we hadn't become friends. But as Buffett's social circle widened, his wife Susie was feeling increasingly isolated back home and made a bold decision, unusual for a Midwestern housewife of that era. She was not divorcing Warren, but she left Omaha for San Francisco to pursue a new life and a new career as a singer. I get why she moved. My dad was getting more famous, and my mother was so not the Mrs. Warren Buffett type at all. You are in a fishbowl, and everybody wants stuff from you, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's not so much fun, really. Their relationship never changed at all. They were completely in love with each other. They talked five, six, seven, eight times a day. They traveled together. Um, she just couldn't live here. To make sure that Warren was taken care of in her absence, Susie turned to her friend, Astrid Menx. Susie knew what a solid, warm person Astrid was. And she sort of asked Astrid to look out for her, Warren. And that's how they got to know each other. Within a few months, Astrid moved in. It's very unorthodox. A lot of people, I'm sure, talked about it and had all kinds of lovely things to say about how weird it was. But I also think, you know what? It's nobody's business what goes on in somebody else's relationship. It worked for the three of them. It worked. Buffett was adjusting to his new domestic arrangements, and his success as an investor in the Post sparked a desire for full ownership of a daily metropolitan paper. He looked at a number of them. The Buffalo Evening News, that was called then, became available. At $33 million, it was Buffett's largest investment yet. The Evening News was one of two Buffalo dailies. Unlike the competition, it didn't have a Sunday edition. The competition, uh, Courier Express, had a morning paper that was sort of flimsy, but they had Sunday, which was a hell of a paper, and Moore and I both knew that Sunday was only going to get stronger and that you had to have a Sunday paper. I knew that we felt faced extinction unless we got into the Sunday newspaper business, and so I did that uh, within, I don't know, six or eight months after we bought the paper, and uh, at that point, all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose when Buffett's competition, the Courier Express, took him to court on an antitrust charge. Daniel Mason was a lawyer representing that paper. It was very hard, we said, to justify a $33 million purchase price uh, based upon the revenues that the news had, unless the news wound up being a monopoly newspaper. A federal judge put a halt to Buffett's Sunday strategy and advertisers began deserting his paper. He's losing money hand over fist. It almost becomes, you know, a, it, just a huge sinkhole. But Buffett didn't back down. We knew that it was not going to be a long-term position to expect two papers to survive in Buffalo. Eventually, one of those papers was going to lose out, and the other paper was going to be a hell of a success because their financials would change. The fight went on for months until the judge's order was overturned. Buffett's competition soon went out of business, and Buffett's paper went on to become hugely profitable. You don't make $40 billion by being Mr. Rogers or by being one of the Muppets. Warren takes no prisoners. He uses every bit of leverage that he can. In 1985, Berkshire Hathaway stock was $2,000 a share. Buffett was now a billionaire. That same year, he made history yet again when he helped finance Capital City's takeover of the American Broadcasting Company. It was the biggest media deal ever, and one that also led to guest appearances on ABC soap operas. 
Oh, uh, Warren, are you thinking of buying out a, a cosmetics company? Oh, Erica, I'd never dream of going in competition with you. Oh, <laughs> well, that's a relief. <laughs> but home was still Omaha, and Buffett saw himself standing apart from the high-flying ways of Wall Street. He was famous for sayings like, if you want to make a lot of money, hold your nose and go to Wall Street. And he had a sign in his office that said that Wall Street was about bulls, bears, and bum steers. But in 1987, Buffett decided to invest $700 million in what was then the nation's largest investment house, the powerful Solomon Brothers. So when he invested in Solomon, which was the classic quintessential Wall Street firm, people said, what is Warren doing? But what always happens with him is, if the chance to make money is big enough, some of these concepts sort of get put by the wayside. But a few years after Buffett's initial investment, Solomon got into big trouble. It turned sour when I got a call in August of, I guess, 1991. They sort of hinted to me about the problems that were coming. A trader named Mosier had done some very bad things in the U.S. government bond market. Those bad things included illegal moves by that Solomon trader to corner the bond market by using unauthorized accounts to increase Solomon's share and force out their competitors. Derek Morn was a vice chairman at Solomon Brothers. Though he had no involvement in the scandal, he was appalled at what was happening. To me, it was clear that we'd broken the law. We'd interfered with the workings of a critical market and that the treasury in the Fed would be less than amused. But the worst was yet to come. Solomon executives found out about the deception, but delayed in reporting it to the authorities. That understandably infuriated the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury, everybody, when it was found out that they hadn't promptly acted. As CEO of Solomon Brothers, John Goodfriend was taking the blame for the mess. <laughs> I remember it vividly. When you make the front page in the right-hand column of the New York Times and you picture but you're a fool, which I probably was. My disrepute became national. Should have been one of the worst days of my life, and probably was. I told Tom Strauss and John Merriweather uh, that we had to go. Talk on Wall Street that Solomon's top officials were offering to resign to prevent the firm's possible debarment as a primary dealer in Treasury securities. The CEO had departed the scene in the company of his lawyers. We were effectively decapitated. In the meantime, this highly leveraged institution is floating in free space. Goodfriend made one last desperate attempt to salvage the company with the only solution he had left, a phone call to Omaha, Nebraska. And he says to Buffett, um, I'm going to have to resign. We need you to come in and be the CEO. Good friend needed someone who both had the confidence of the government and in some larger way the confidence of America to say, yes, this is the Wall Street guy we trust. And literally there was only one person in America who could fit that description, and that was Warren Buffett. And I wasn't involved in the thing so that I was not tainted. The hope was that I would be credible with uh, all the people that were mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of them. When Buffett arrived in New York, the company was in a state of panic. There's no future and there's no present for an indicted financial firm. The firm would have folded. I was very clear, and I advised Warren of what the consequences would be, which not only that the firm would fail rapidly, but that there would be uh, significant systemic impacts on other institutions. Buffett was now helming a company about to go down in disgrace. Warren used to say that it takes a lifetime to build a reputation and five minutes to lose it. And he was afraid that Solomon could be that five minutes for him. It was August 18th, 1991. Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady had ruled that Solomon was out of the bond business. It was announced at about 10 in the morning on a Sunday. The U.S. Treasury had knocked us off the list of a really acceptable people, <laughs> primary dealers, that, that would have been uh, a death blow to the company. So I had to get that changed by the time Tokyo opened. He only had a few hours. Once the Tokyo markets opened, the firm's fate would be sealed. The Japanese banks could have begun a run on the bank by selling our stock, by liquidating their positions with us, 
by demanding cash, they could very quickly drain the firm of its capital and its liquidity. That momentum would transfer to the London market. And by the time New York opened, we would have been in acute crisis. Buffett called longtime confidant Charlie Munger into New York for an emergency meeting. I will never forget that as long as I live. That was the most awesome moment in my life because that would have been a national calamity. And it looked for a long time as though the government was just going to say, the hell with you, Solomon. Warren Buffett spent the entire day in frantic phone calls to Washington, trying to get the feds to back off. I was scared stiff. And it probably came through in my voice when I was talking. I was talking to Nick Brady, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, and Jerry Corrigan, who was the head of the Federal Reserve of New York. And these people were deservedly, uh, understandably, furious with what Solomon had done and and uh, uh, there were a lot of people that wanted us to go out of business over that weekend and I didn't know what was going to happen. At the 11th hour there was one final call with Nicholas Brady. There was a big emotional catch in Warren's voice when he was talking to Nick and I think Nick realized that if he's that disturbed by this maybe he's right that we should back off just a little. He didn't, didn't have to back off very much, just a little bit, and uh, it prevented the calamity. A visibly shaken Buffett faced dozens of reporters waiting in the Solomon Auditorium. The Treasury saw the Solomon Inc. Board of Directors today uh, take some major steps to uh, install new management. Both the company and I personally uh, promised Treasury that we would... Uh, do everything we could do to uh, uh, aggressively help them in, uh, in finding out anything we've done wrong in the past and to make very sure that it doesn't happen in the future. And they want that and they need it and they're entitled to it. Buffett emerged the hero, his reputation more exalted than ever. Warren Buffett meeting with the financial community, signing autographs. They love him. The man with the squeaky clean image who's trying to clean up the mess at Solomon Brothers. I'm going to be the American Bar Association's man of the year. I mean, we are spending a lot of money on, on legal fees. Uh. John Goodfriend found himself cast as the heavy. You need a villain. Somebody who led all these people astray and did all kinds of bad things. But I didn't see how I could fight it. I couldn't put Solomon at risk. Warren and Charlie were not our advocates in this situation. They maintained their purity, and we were down in the dumps. Life. But Warren's work wasn't over. To seal the deal, he had to personally take charge of cleaning up at Solomon Brothers. It was miserable. I was there nine months and four days, and it's not an accident that I can tell you 20 years later exactly how long I was there. but. But it was important that it get done. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, and I wouldn't wish what happened to the firm you know, on, on anybody. But in a sense, I learned a lot. In 1993, Berkshire Hathaway stock hit $17,000 a share, and Buffett was world famous. But no amount of global traveling could change some of Buffett's ingrained habits. Let's talk about Warren's diet. Um, here are the vegetables he'll eat. Corn on the cob, french fries, hash browns, and the fruit would be uh, banana cream pie, strawberry shortcake. I think that's the end of the fruit. He also drinks, you know, several cherry cokes a day. I've never in my life, and I'm not kidding, seen the man drink a sip of water, ever. When he went to China, he took a pile of coupons from McDonald's with him and that he's in China for however long it was, and he ate McDonald's hamburgers. The 1990s and 2000s would be the era of Berkshire Hathaway's greatest expansion. Brought into the corporate fold was the nation's biggest furniture store, a leading mobile home manufacturer, Fruit of the Loom underwear, Benjamin Moore paints, Dairy Queen, Geico Insurance. Over 70 companies in all, with a combined 250,000 employees. If you look at the assembly of businesses that uh, Berkshire represents, 
it's businesses that have been handpicked by Warren Buffett into his holding company that's reaching a level of recognition that many people in America never get to. He loves to use the expression that it's his canvas and he, you know, like Picasso, he wants to paint and to work on that canvas as long as he is able, you know. That's what it's all about for him. Two of Buffett's new investments made headlines by flying in the face of conventional market wisdom. He bought his hometown newspaper, the Omaha World Herald, and he bought the Burlington Northern Railroad. Suddenly, Warren Buffett invested in it, and wow, railroads were the hot thing because they had all these virtues that somehow nobody recognized. That is the thing that Warren Buffett has done over and over is he invests in something, and then everybody looks at it and says, I saw it there. Why didn't I recognize these things all along? In Omaha, Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting has become a place of pilgrimage for tens of thousands of shareholders. It's really an amazing thing. The stadium is filled and the spotlights are on a small folding table with two 80-year-olds at that table. And those two 80-year-olds have more stamina than anyone else in the room. Hi. They're dying to see Warren Buffett and hear what he has to say. His favorite thing I think that happens every year is the shareholders meeting and he gets energized from it. He goes nonstop from Friday to Sunday night and, and as the weekend goes on he gets more energy. Can't explain it. It's got to be those burgers. <laughs> In the 2000s Buffett was worth tens of billions of dollars money he planned on giving away to a foundation to be run by his wife Susie. But in 2004, Susie died of a stroke following cancer surgery. It was a huge shock for all of us. My dad, I can't, I can't explain how much he loved her and how much he relied on her. I am going to start crying talking about this. Um, it, you know, he'll never totally get over it. None of us probably will, but she was really something very special. We had always sort of talked about things and planned things assuming he would die first. So when she died it was it really was big. Two years after his wife Susie's death Buffett married Astrid Menx in a private ceremony and he announced that he was pledging the bulk of his fortune not to his children but to the foundation run by Bill and Melinda Gates. Bill Gates has been one of Buffett's closest friends since the early 1990s. So it was, you know, kind of phenomenal. It made us step up our ambition level, uh, add a lot of things we wouldn't have been able to do. And uh, so now every year, it's a gigantic gift that allows us to be double what we would have been without it. They're young, they're energetic, they work much harder at it than I would. I get to keep doing what I love doing. You know, and, and they're going to achieve the same things much better than I would. It's a perfect solution for me to get somebody else to do the work. I've always been good at that. But as his 80th birthday approached, an international crisis would open yet another new chapter in Buffett's life. Absolutely stunning morning on Wall Street. Lehman Brothers filing for bankruptcy. In 2007, a single share of Berkshire Hathaway stock hit an all-time high of $150,000. And people call this work. <laughs> but the next year, the entire U.S. economy was in crisis mode. The Dow closed Monday's session down more than 500 points. With many of its financial institutions collapsing under mountains of debt. The dominoes started falling and they were huge dominoes. They started falling at a pace that was breathtaking. The terrified bankers in New York needed emergency help from anyone that was still solvent. And it wasn't just money they needed. Warren Buffett is one enormous good housekeeping seal of approval. And if he's putting money into a situation, they're going to assume that he's intelligent enough to be making that investment because he thinks he's going to generate a satisfactory return off of it. And that will calm people's fears uh, when fear is at its highest. Among the businesses that received lifelines from Warren Buffett were Goldman Sachs, GE, and later Bank of America. If you have uh, you know, Warren Buffett giving you that imprimatur saying, I have faith in the company, uh, you know, the market will, will recover and you know, eventually it did. 
In 2011, Warren Buffett was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's demonstrated that integrity isn't just a good trait, it is good for business. But who will succeed this financial icon at the head of Berkshire Hathaway? In 2011, the man seen as Buffett's heir apparent was caught in a scandal. High-level executive David Sokol was buying stock for himself in a company called Lubrizol, while pitching Lubrizol as a Berkshire acquisition. He should have disclosed it to me initially, and then, he, then I would have had him sell it or do something of the sort, or we wouldn't have bought the company. I mean, it, it, it just was not something that, that should have been held back. David Sokol left the company, and that crisis ended. In 2012, Buffett announced that he was being treated for prostate cancer and that he's identified his successor at Berkshire. But that name has not yet been made public. What he has made public are the political and economic causes that he feels passionate about. I think in the last couple years, he has seen some places where he thinks, if I open my mouth, it might make a difference. What he's most vocal about is what he sees as the inequities of the tax system something that's come to be known as the Buffett Rule. There's all kinds of ultra-rich who pay normal taxes, but there are a, there's a small segment, but you can find them very easily, who pay very low taxes, including me. He considers himself, you know, lucky to have been born in America at this time in history. Buffett is just a unique character who came along in a period when America became fascinated with finance, who did it better than anybody, and you know, he's been able to bring Wall Street back to Main Street in a way that I don't think we'll ever see again. I think he's one of the most memorable people I've ever met. Uh, he's touched a lot of lives uh, with what he's done, and everybody that he's dealt with has made money doing it, and has improved their life. There are really no people like Warren where, you know, we should sit back and, and, and benefit from the deep thinking he's done about business uh, since he was very young. I think it's all about I'm the world's greatest investor and I've got 40 billion dollars to prove the point. I just have a great time every day. I mean, I, I am getting to do exactly what I want to do in life. You know, it doesn't get any better than that.